Hi, welcome everyone. Good to see you here. Welcome to a masterclass on the legal aspects of uh, CPDC. This masterclass is organized by MAS uh, in collaboration with Tribe Accelerator as part of our global CBDC challenge. As you know, uh, the finalists of this challenge were announced in late August and are going through an eight week uh, acceleration phase attending a series of masterclasses which aim to help finalists develop and refine the solutions. In the first hour of each masterclass, this features a public lecture by a world leading subject matter expert and the second hour uh, follows a round table uh, with the finalists only. So today we have the privilege of having Simon Gleason deliver this masterclass. Simon is a partner at Clifford Chance and has been listed in all the major legal directories as one of the world's leading experts in financial services and banking regulation, capital markets and derivatives. So I'm confident that uh, the next hour will be a very fulfilling one. Before we begin, uh, just some housekeeping matters. Feel free, please, to use the chat function to communicate with all the participants or just the organizers. There is also a Q&A chat box. Please put your questions in the Q&A early uh, so that we have a better chance of getting your questions answered in the session, which must end on the hour. And so with this, uh, I'd like to hand the time over to Simon. Simon, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, right, this is the point where, here we go. Now, I'm, I'm rather, I'm rather hoping you can, uh, you can see my screen. Is that all right? Yes, it's perfect. Brilliant. Okay. Um, right. Uh, now, um, I'm delighted to say that I'm going to try and keep this almost entirely free of law in the technical sense of the word. Um, I do want to start by explaining an important thing about the integration of law, finance, and everything else. And it's very roughly this. I'm so old, I can remember the dot-com boom. And in particular, I can remember a particular attitude which went something like this. Law is something that happens after the event. First a product is invented, then people decide how it should be legally categorized. Therefore, the important thing is to invent the product and leave it to the lawyers after the event to sweep up. Um, this, as some of the older amongst you may recall, went spectacularly wrong. The reason for this is that law is not retrospective, it's prospective. As soon as you do anything, it has to be fitted in to the existing legal structure because that's what the existing legal structure does. The existing legal structure may need to be changed to reflect new developments and frequently is. But when you're creating new products and to a large extent CBDC is a genuinely new product to the extent that there's something that we really haven't seen before, you have to accept the fact that in the event of disputes, and there will be disputes, the approach that will be taken is to fit what has been created into the existing legal categories. And what that means is when you are creating a new product, you do have to be aware as to what the existing legal categories are and how what you're doing will be forced into them because it will be forced into them by the courts in due course. So that's why, even if you have no interest in law whatsoever, you still need to be aware of the key legal concepts when designing the product. Now, um, if, we, if we have a look at the cryptoverse, the sort of new, new phrase, um, the key, point here, I think, is this. The regulatory system, such as it is, operates on the basis that everything falls within one or two buckets. Basically, it's either money or it's an investment. And that idea that money is something you buy investments with, money is not itself an investment, and therefore its circulation is not regulated, has worked very nicely for the last three and a half thousand years. 
Um, that clear distinction between money and investments is smeared across the slide that I've got up now. What you have here is a simple gradated process whereby you start with very money-like things, you end with very investment-like things, and practically everything in the middle is a bit of one, a bit of the other, a bit of both. This is why the whole crypto process gives financial regulators such difficulty. And you might think that CBDCs are towards the easier end of this spectrum because surely they're money, aren't they? Well, are they? Um, if we start with just the nature of a CBDC, you know, what is it? Um, well, nobody knows. There is a big debate which currently goes on within the legal bits of central banks. And I'm not going to do anything more today than just mention this as to what exactly a CBDC is as regards money. And the point here is if I create a sterling CBDC, is that sterling DC exactly the same as a pound? Is it a token that reflects a pound? Or is it something else altogether? So just the question of, is there a difference between a note created by a central bank and a token created by a central bank is actually a fairly sophisticated question. But we can put all that aside for the time being and just look at the, look at the basic questions, which to some extent fall into the four buckets that I've identified on this slide. Um, the biggest of them is, is, do you want it to be used internationally? Most central banks look at that the other way round, and you can see this very clearly in the G7 set of principles for CBDCs that was published this morning. And the real question is this, most central banks are reasonably relaxed about the idea of CBDCs that they have created circulating internally within their own country. That's not really all that different from what banknotes do today. You ask the question, how happy are you for your CBDCs to go outside your country? What you actually get is two entirely different answers. One of them is, well, that sounds splendid because it's seniorage, it's revenue, this is a good thing. The other is that the more of our CBDCs go outside our country and therefore out of our control, the less control we have over our monetary system. And we're not sure that's a really good idea. Now, this is the thing which has really taken, um, taken, take, taken the debate about CBDCs generally into this world of retail or wholesale. Because really, when we talk about wholesale CBDCs, what we're talking about is a product which is designed to be usable in large size internationally. And when we talk about retail CBDCs, what we're talking about is products designed to be used in relatively small size domestically. So if you're creating a CBDC, if what you want is to create a retail but not a wholesale CBDC, then the first thing you're going to have to ask yourself is how do I keep my CDC retail? How do I keep it onshore? How do I keep it held in reasonably small size? And there's and the specific question there, and this, this debate comes up a lot, is if I'm trying to keep my CBDC onshore, can I do that simply by legal means, writing sort of exchange control legislation that says people can't take it offshore? Or do I have to do it systemically within the CBD coin itself and impose, try and impose some sort of usability or transfer restriction on it 
which prohibits it being held in large size and prohibits it being transferred to other people. So that whole sort of wholesale retail thing actually embodies quite a deep policy choice about why you created the CBDC in the first place and what you wanted to achieve. Um, the next big question is convertibility into cash. Now, cash, but now this is this is this is kind of difficult because strictly speaking, the only person who can create cash is the central bank of the country concerned. Let's assume that the UK has created a UK CBDC, you know, Brit, Britcoin. I, I am a retail punter in the UK. I have some Britcoin in my wallet. How do I turn that into cash? Because in general, since I don't have an account with the central bank, because in general, retail investors just don't have direct contact with the central bank. Do I, does the central bank have to open a sort of retail conversion window or can the central bank sit back and say, if you retail investor want to turn your CBDC into cash, then you can't come to us. You just have to go to whichever commercial bank you have your deposit account with and get them to do it. And of course, you've got the same issue the other way around. If I'm a retail investor and I want a CBDC, can I get it from the central bank? Do I have to go through a commercial bank or someone else? Because this, this issue of on-ramps and off-ramps, how do you create the things and how do the things get converted into money? This is one of these issues which is weirdly straightforward if you're talking about a wholesale CBDC, but actually becomes quite challenging if you're talking about a retail CBDC, precisely because retail investors in general do not have um, central bank bank accounts. And the last of the big issues is how exactly do I create this wretched thing? Um, this takes us to some of the debates about distributed ledgers, and I mean, leaving aside the stuff about electricity, about the sort of sheer volume of electricity consumption. Um, the question for the central bank is effectively operational resilience and security. Um, the central banks probably care about operational resilience more than anybody else. And the, again, the fear, for want of a better word, of not so much losing control, but of something happening over which you have no control is, is, is a very serious one. So um, on the one hand, we have issues about what, what does the market want? But on the other hand, we have issues of what does the central bank want? And the easiest way of thinking about um, thinking about the way the public, the public sector generally thinks about these issues is their starting point is what could go wrong? Could we control it? Distributed ledgers cause central bankers sleepless nights. Um, if we look at the next question, which is, which 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 is the why the whys and the worries. Um, first point, of course, is the very simple one of what are you actually trying to achieve in the first place. Now, there are two big lumps to this. One of them, and they, they really fall into two of the three categories, sort of you know, as essences of money. Uh, one of them is the means of payment. We'll come on in a minute to the store of value, but we'll just stick with means of payment for the time being. It seems reasonably clear that if you had a working CBDC, which was capable of being transferred in more or less real time on a ledger, 
that that would give you a fairly significant improvement in the quality of the operation of the payment system. And one of the things you have to remember in that direction is that in general, central banks and payment regulators generally see payment delays as a source of operational and credit risk within the system. This goes all the way back to Bank Herstad. But the way to think about it is that at any given time, a commercial bank has a very large receivable and a very large payable resulting from payment instructions that have been received but not yet executed. And if you could compress those, you would actually have made a very substantial contribution to systemic stability. So the starting point is we, sh we could take a lot of pain, effort, cost, and vulnerability out of the payment system if these things could be used to, um, to, 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 to cut payment delays. Um, but when you then look at, you know, where, where are we going here? Well, cash, physical cash? Well, yes, but I mean, how many people really use physical cash nowadays? These instruments only really become useful when they start to replace payment cards, um, electronic payments of all forms, um, the, 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 the various folk. And then you get into the issue of credit cards, which I like, I like to think of as a particularly interesting example. A credit card does two things. It sells two things packaged as one. One of them is a payment service. The other is credit. It, some users of credit cards only really use the payment service, but quite a lot of them do use the credit function. Now, if you were to try and leave uh, CBDCs into that relationship, you've effectively taken what was a single product and turned it into two separate products. So who is going to provide the credit? Well, it ain't gonna be the central bank. So the real point here is that by creating the CBDC, it's not that you've solved the problem, you've created one part of a solution to the problem and the private sector is going to have to go and do the rest. And this is true of, a number of the other things that you can see on this slide. And the key point here, I think, is just this, that creating a CBDC in a relatively small number of cases is a complete solution to a problem, but in a much larger number of cases is actually just creating a tool which will then have to be deployed by commercial banks and others in order to build the next generation solutions. So CBDCs, retail CBDCs, are really a platform for the development of a new generation of retail financial services. And that really feeds through into all of these things. Um, just before we go any further, worth thinking about how CBDCs sit alongside the alternative products that are already out there. Um, we have a, a already a dizzying array of um, coins, both stable and otherwise, in tokenized form. Um, what the central banks will tell you very proudly is CBDCs are entirely different from all of these other things and are sui generis and are a completely new sort of thing in themselves. Uh, this is neither true uh, technically nor legally. Um, and it is unquestionably the case that, that central banks would very much like it to be true. Um, I, to my mind, the best way of thinking about these is that, a centra, is that what a CBDC actually is, is a token with a kite mark. And you can see that both in the recent um, CPMI document, which basically floated the idea of certain stable coins being certified as CPMI compliant and therefore by performing a similar function to um, CBDCs. It is worth remembering in this context, by the way, that 
if you look at the history of the United Kingdom, the United States, and indeed a large number of other places, privately created banknotes were very happily in circulation for the majority of certainly the recent past. The way that history worked was that first you had private bank banknotes, and these notes were over time replaced by central bank banknotes, which basically outcompeted the private bank banknotes because of the relative absence of underlying credit risk. So the idea of a world where the central bank produces one of a number of circulating notes and has to outcompete those notes over time is actually the recognized historical pattern. And of course, you do have the point here that it is not open to governments really to ban the use of anything other than their domestic CBDC in their territory, if only because there are good reasons why people need to operate in the currency of other countries from time to time. And any argument that works for foreign exchange today will work for stable coins tomorrow. So, um, and of course, as again, the point this slide makes, there are goodness knows how many ways of creating a stable coin, um, ranging from uh, backing them one to one with fiat money through to the creation of a buy and sell algorithm. Um, but CBDCs will always, I think, for the medium term future, coexist with private sector stable coins. And uh, there's going, there will be some quite interesting issues as to, as to relative ease of use. Because if the central banks do what the public sector sometimes does, which is to take a long time to produce something which is clunkier and harder to use than a private sector equivalent, then it does seem somewhere between likely and probable that they may find the market electing against them to use privately created stable coins, which although they may be more credit sensitive, if they're cheaper and easier to use, you know what, that's what people will use. Um, it is also worth saying a word about electronic money tokens. You know, this is sort of easy pass, London Underground Oyster, that sort of thing. Um, why am I talking about this in this context? Because if you think about it, what those tokens actually are, are a form of programmable money. When I give money to London Underground to buy an Oyster card, what I'm doing, rather weirdly, is exchanging unrestricted value for a form of value which is restricted to the extent it can only be used to buy one thing. Why would I do that? Because the seller effectively requires me to pay in restricted money. So I have to turn my unrestricted money into restricted money in order to be able to use it to buy this particular thing. And the reason that matters in this context is that one of the really big debates about the possible future of CBDC, particularly retail CBDC, is precisely this question of should it be capable of being made programmable, which when you boil it down, means should it be possible to restrict the way in which a CBDC is to be used such that certain people can only use it to buy certain things? You talk to the Americans about it, um, one of the things that gets floated from time to time is a sort of CBDC equivalent of food stamps. You know, if you're handing out money to the very poor in the form of benefits, can you restrict some of that money such that it can only be spent on food? And that, you know, again, it's not a point really that occurs at all in the wholesale CBDC world. But the more you get into retail CBDC, the more these issues of programmability and control come to the fore. And of course, the last point there is that um, 
one of the big problems that everybody had, you know, this is not theoretical, this is happening in Sweden today, is that the more wholesale, the more retail CBDCs increase in circulation, the greater the perceived problem of financial exclusion. Because, you know, there's a fairly strong correlation between people who don't have the necessary access to smartphones and electronic infrastructure to be able to hold CBDCs and the very, very poor and the people who are most in need of, of, of assistance. And of course, the problem you have in Sweden is that since the Swedish economy is now almost entirely cashless, you know, go, 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 go shopping in Stockholm and you'll be lucky to find a shop that doesn't have a little notion on the counter saying cash not accepted here. This makes life very difficult if you are one of the relatively small number of Swedes who do not have a bank account or a smartphone and live basically off government benefits, which you pick up in the form of cash. How do you buy food if the damn food shop won't take cash? So this, again, feeds into the programmability issue. Um, and there is, there is quite a lot here, not because anybody has decided they know the answer, but because the answers are, um, really skip over that one, it, it, because the, 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 answer, the answers are simply too complicated. Now, um, we turn to the next question, which is how does all this fit into the existing system? Um, it is worth, starting just by asking the question, well, you know, what do you mean by money in the first place? What does money actually do? Well, money is simply a means of discharging a debt. That's all it is, it's nothing more than that. Um, and of course, one way of looking at it is that if when I pay, if I buy something from you and pay you money, all I'm really doing is giving you access to a claim against someone else, whether it be the central bank, whether it be my bank, whether it be someone else. But realistically, money is anything which people will accept in discharge of a debt. And the reason for emphasizing that point is that if people generally accept something as money, it's money. Every so often you get into these rather curious discussions about the nature of legal tender and what happens if the government passes a law that says this particular thing is legal tender and that particular thing isn't. And the answer to that question is, by and large, it makes absolutely no difference whatsoever. Making something legal tender, weirdly enough, is not something governments can do by legislation. You want proof of that, you can have a look at the recent history of Argentina, or for that matter, Zimbabwe. The mere fact that the government says you must accept our currency does not cut a lot of ice when the value of that currency is collapsing. By and large, if people accept it in payment, it's money. And if people don't accept it in payment, it isn't. And there really isn't terribly much that legislation can do about that. Now, the reason that matters is we have to spend a few minutes thinking about how, how the economy actually works, or at least how the supply of money to the economy actually works. Um, this is a picture of the UK economy, not such a terribly long time ago. I put some numbers in there just to give you an idea of the sort of relative sizes. So very loosely, the central bank provides about half a trillion to the commercial banks. If you look at the balance sheet of the central bank, basically what it owns is deposits by the commercial banks. The commercial banks then provide money to the real economy. This is kind of an important point. When you talk to central bankers, they will sometimes tell you the central bank provides money to the economy. 
No, it doesn't. The way the world works today, the central bank provides money to the commercial banks and the commercial banks provide money to the real economy. And when the real economy pays its debts one to another, it pays in central bank money. It's like pays in commercial bank money. And um, the, the relatively small amount of physical cash Physical cash is the one way at the moment where a real economy participant can make a payment using a direct claim on the central bank, but that number is tiny relative to the size of the economy. So if you look at this drawing, you can see that one way of looking at CBDCs is that what's going on here is the CBDCs will just perform exactly the same function that physical cash is performing. But just before we get there, um, it's important to think about um, the commercial bank stage and what's actually going on. Now, um, this is a very simple drawing of a very simple concept. I am paid my salary, I put it into my bank. At some point thereafter, I buy something. I instruct my bank to make a payment to the bank of the person I'm paying the money to. That means my bank has held that money for a period because I do not spend 100% of my salary immediately I receive it. So what happens in the middle? Uh, short answer, the bank takes the money and does something with it. We'll come on in a minute as to what. But just before we get there, uh, we need to look in a little bit more detail about how payments actually happen. Now, the reason this is important is there are actually three entirely different intellectual models of bank Pay, of commercial bank payment out there. And they actually all loosely correspond to a different type of architecture for coins. So it's quite useful to go through them. Uh, the first of these is, uh, is, is the gyro bank model. The point about the gyro bank model is if I want to make a payment to somebody, that somebody has to have an account with that gyro bank. A gyro bank is nothing more than a ledger. And in the gyro bank model, the only thing you can do is to make transfers between two account holders at that gyro bank, and the transfer is entirely internal. So the payer instructs the gyro bank to make an amendment to its ledgers, and the gyro bank does so. The payee doesn't have to do anything. The payee's account is credited as a direct result of the instruction from the payer. But the point about this is it is an entirely closed system and the payment is effectively completed by the payer giving an instruction without the payee having to do anything at all. So that's the gyro bank model. We then come to the check model. Now, the point about the check model, some of you may be old enough to remember checks in real life, although I doubt it. Um, the point about the check model is that a check basically is something that the payer provides to the payee. So there is a transfer which occurs entirely outside the bank about which the bank knows nothing. And in, the, in this model, it's up to the payee to tell the bank to make the transfer. So to some extent, the only real difference here is that whereas in the gyro bank model, it was the payer's instruction that completed the payment, in the check model, what the payer does is to give the payee an authorization to make the, to, to, to instruct the payment. And it's then up to the payee to do it. So there's a, there's, a, there's a significant difference to the agency. Now, 
The third of these is the idea of the note bank. Now, the way this works is that the, what the payer gets from the bank is a bank note. Now, for this purpose, I'm just using the term bank note as shorthand for a physical thing that can, it, it basically embeds a promise to pay by the note bank. Now, the point about this is that once that note has been created, it can then pass from hand to hand to hand to hand to hand and be used as a means of payment by people who have no connection with the bank at all. So in the note bank system, what the bank is actually doing is creating a token. And that token is then capable of being unrestrictedly transferred until you get to the end of the game where the token is transferred to somebody who has an account with the note bank who then delivers that note back to the bank in exchange for having his account credited with value. So where we, what we've got to here is an idea of unrestricted transferability of the token, whereas in the Czech example, what you had was effectively restricted transferability. And in the gyro bank example, there's really no transferability at all. There's just the power to instruct a change to the ledger. Now, again, you can see, you can see, you can see bits of all of those in some of the ideas that float around, but it's particularly important when you have central banks thinking about these things. And the reason for that is our old friend, um, financial crime and money laundering. If I was a private sector creator of a token, I must confess I would be perfectly happy with the note bank model because I don't think I care very much who owns my token. If I'm a central bank, I probably do care who owns my token. One of the things that gets central banks more wound up than almost anything else is the more or less certain knowledge that the majority of the high value notes that they create are probably used in payment for small and medium scale illegal activity. What they absolutely do not want to do is to create an instrument which turns out to be used for widespread criminal activity, potentially on a slightly wider scale. So when you look at these options from a central bank point of view, the note bank structure is in many respects the least attractive option and the gyro bank system, whereby nobody can do anything unless, they're, unless they've got an account is the most attractive option. But of course the gyro bank system is very much the least useful unless everybody in the country has an account with the central bank, which is a model that makes perfect sense in logic and very little in practice. So this question of how you actually record the transfer, who does it, how it works, can there be intermediate transfers between external parties, is kind of quite an important design feature. Um, now just turning to the whole rather well, difficult question of store of value, because we can't avoid it completely. Uh, this drawing, uh, first of all, it's sort of what happens today. The real answer to my question, what happens between the time when you give your salary to your bank and the time when you spend it, is that the bank takes it and lends it to people. Primary source of funding for lending to the real economy is deposits held with commercial banks. Once you've got that firmly in your mind, you can see why um, governments and central banks worry so much about the likes of Libra. Now, if you think about or DM as it now calls itself, if you think about the DM notion, there's really nothing difficult about saying to people in the real economy, you, you give me 100 million sterling, I will issue 100 million coins, I will take the money that you gave me and invest it in 
government debt. And what you've really done there is to create something which is for all practical purposes, a private sector central bank, because it's really doing the same thing the central bank is doing. It's monetizing government credit. Um, so you now in this drawing have a, um, have effectively a private central bank operating alongside the public central bank. And you, you don't have to be a genius to see why people would dislike that so much. Um, the problem is, where does that go? If you imagine a world where um, central bank digital currencies have completely taken over from commercial banks, so let's imagine an economy where all retail transactions are conducted using CBDCs. That looks a bit like this. But what you've done there is you've defunded all of that lending because the deposits that were previously held by the commercial banks and lent out are now sent down to the central bank which gives you the problem that, well, who's going to lend money to the economy? Well, it's going to have to be the central bank, isn't it? No central bank regards this as an even remotely attractive option. And by the way, if you think about a purely Libra world, it's even worse because that money gets, gets flowed through to the government. And now the government has to be, um, has, 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 has to be the provider of... Um, of uh, lending to the economy. And that is why, if you look at the, um, again, the G7 paper that came out this morning, um, there is a lot of concern about how CBDCs work alongside the commercial banking system because the idea of effectively nationalizing the supply of credit to the economy is a very unattractive one. And so the point here is that one of the big design features of a CBDC has to be, how does it operate alongside the commercial banking industry? So, you know, this, this is really not an option. This or something like it, with preferably a central bank instead of a private provider has to be the way forward. But again, I think there were a number of areas where designing a CBDC to work alongside um, commercial bank money is actually rather harder than designing it on the basis that um, it's, it, it's, it's going to be the sole means of payment in the economy. Uh, just one last point. There is a lot of debate at the moment about the difference between token-based and account-based CBDCs. Um, doesn't make a hell of a lot of difference to the user, but I thought it might be worth taking a few seconds before we stop for questions uh, just to explain the difference. Now, this is effective. This is an account-based CBDC. What's happened here is that the CBDC itself is effectively tokenizing a claim on the central bank that exists through the RTGS. So the CBDC here is not money, it's a token whose ownership indicates a claim to money. That is different from um, the tokenized or native CBDC, because in this drawing, what the CBDC is, is itself a direct claim on the central bank. So in this drawing, the CBDC actually is money. Now, there are a number of rather subtle differences between these two, but the one which is worth flagging because it's really quite important is this in the um in the account-based cbdc structure 
Effectively, that only works when the RTGS system is open. If what, you, if what you want to do is to record claims on the central bank, the central bank can only really book those claims during its opening hours. And so transfers outside opening hours are difficult. And again, the reason that matters is if you're a central bank, you worry about AML, you worry about customer identification, transfers outside your working hours, which you can't police, are troublesome. Um, in the native variety, that problem goes away. The native variety can be transferred 24-7, and to some extent, it can be transferred between anyone and anyone. But that's exactly the problem we were trying to solve. This debate about sort of native versus tokenized actually brings to a sharp point the biggest policy decision that the central bank has to take in respect of these instruments, which is to what extent is it prepared to allow them to circulate outside its direct control and into the hands of people whom it has not identified or pre-vetted? Um, and, oh, hang on, there's just one last thing, um, and that is this. Um, if you were st starting on the right, if you think about how a deposit works at the moment, it's very simple. The money is paid to the commercial bank. The commercial bank owns it. The commercial bank lends it out. It gets money back. But all the customer has for a commercial bank account today is a money claim on the bank itself. Now, if instead of money you were dealing with securities, say, the position would be entirely different. If you give your securities to your bank to look after, you continue to own those securities. All the bank does is to look after them for you. And as a matter of law, you are the owner of those securities. So just ending where we began, um, in a world that had a clear distinction between money and investments, which of those two models is going to be applied to CBDCs? Well, um, it probably looks something like the drawing on the left, where you have a wallet provider providing, a, providing what is equivalent to a custody service. So it looks as if um, the future for holdings of CBDCs is going to be through wallet providers such that the customer continues to own the CBDCs. But this is a really big but. The difference between those first two columns is that in the commercial bank money column, you know what happens? The customer effectively gets interest from the bank. In the securities column, you know what happens? The customer has to pay for the service he receives because the custodian can't do anything with the securities and has to do something about it. Which of these two, a remunerated service or a service you have to pay for, do you think retail investors are more likely to prefer? Discuss. Um, so on the list of things we don't know, along with all the others, one of them is how these things will be held, how the service will be provided to retail investors. And I think it's probably a good point to stop for questions. Is that about right? Yeah, thank you so much, Simon. And we do have indeed a few really good questions here. I thought I'll start with uh, the, the more recent ones, the ones that came in a little later, only because they pertain a little more closely to what you just talked about. Uh, which is uh, one of them, uh, the general user requirement in any internet service is that it's instant and it's free. Uh, yep. And if that applies to CBDC services, this may be a bit of an unfair question, but I thought you might have a view on it. Yeah. How do you think service providers are going to make money out of it? So we saw in the three columns just yep. now, you had your uh, yes. wallet provider, bank. So any views on that? Ooh, um, right. The, I, I, I have a sneaking suspicion, although this may be defamatory and I couldn't prove it, that um, 
when the likes of Facebook were thinking about this, I suspect they had the same business model as for any other internet service, which is let's sell the data. Now, that's interesting for a bunch of reasons. The reason why bank secrecy is such a big thing is that the data about your spending, you know, what did you spend, where did you spend it, who did you spend it on, is the most valuable personal data about you imaginable. The idea of that being sold, I think everybody finds really profoundly uncomfortable. Um, if, if we assume that you can't use the standard internet model, which is to provide a free service to gain information and then sell the information, then the question becomes a hell of a lot harder. Um, certainly in the, uh, in the traditional world, the answer was spread. Money by definition cannot, um, cannot be remunerated. And an, an interest bearing monetary unit is useless for pricing purposes. So if what you're doing is you're creating a monetary unit and you're investing the proceeds in an interest bearing security, then that's potentially where you make your money. But that was fine in a world where interest rates were sufficiently positive. It's not a business model that works in a zero interest rate environment, which of course is exactly where we currently are. And if you can't do either of those, I, I confess the answer to your question is I'm a bit stuck. I'm not sure I know what the answer to that one is. Yeah, and I think that's why the question was being asked. Now, we had a, a number of um, masterclasses where we did talk about something similar. And I can assure you, you're not alone in uh, saying that I'm not very sure where we would be here. Yep. Uh, but always good to get uh, everyone's views on this. And also related to this was uh, this question on whether you're arguing that fractional banking is not possible with CBDC. Uh, because it is issued by a central bank. So the banking model uh, basically would be turned on its head, I suppose, and look more like a wallet system. Yes, absolutely. No, that, 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 that's absolutely right. And I mean, really, that was, that was the point of my block drawing, that if you imagine a world which is fully based on CBDCs, then fractional banking has disappeared. And the problem then becomes, where are you going to get credit from and there are various people who will tell you with varying degrees of confidence that if the banking system stops becoming an engine for the creation of credit all that will happen will be that new credit providers of other forms will spring up now i i, I don't philosophically have any because yeah re realistically if you look at banks as we know them. They're a relatively recent invention. Their business model involves combining three entirely separate things. You know, they provide, they're the gatekeepers to the payment system, they're the storers of value for the economy, and they take credit risk for reward. There is no reason why those functions should not be disintermediated into three separate types of businesses. And, you know, philosophically, the idea of a world of wallet providers providing only payment services and um, credit funds making loans for profit is entirely intellectually uh, conceivable. The difficulty I have with it is that the existing model seems to me to have efficiencies within it, which would disappear if you disaggregated it. <laughs> And I, I have yet to be convinced that there is this huge wave of non-bank money, which is just itching to come into, uh, in, into the credit market. And I think, to be fair, even the recent Bank of England paper, which was as optimistic on this subject as anything I've ever seen, did actually conclude that the upshot of this disaggregation would be an increase in the cost of credit to the real economy. Yeah, thank you so much. And I think we do have... Uh, time for just one last question um, mm. on the topic of uh, foreign entities holding CBDCs and impacting mm. central bank monetary policy. So the mm. question is, why would this be different from the existing situation where, say, for example, USD is held overseas and vast uh, 
reserve quantities, I suppose. This is already happening, so what's new, I suppose? Right. Um, there's nothing unusual about uh, governments holding bonds issued by other governments. That's, 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 that's a separate issue. As far as money is concerned, the starting point, oddly enough, is an essay that uh, Milton Friedman wrote a very long time ago. It's called uh, the, 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 the Euro Dollar Market, Some Basic Facts. And he makes the point that the, the thing about commercial, the thing about a commercial bank account money is that it was perfectly possible for this huge Euro dollar balance to develop in, um, in, in Europe because it was created by commercial banks granting dollar credits in Europe. That, those dollars, if you like, didn't really exist. They were created by private commercial banks. The reason that CBDCs are different is that they're not imaginary, they're real. The only way your CBDCs get abroad is if somebody buys them and takes them abroad. That is absolutely fine as long as they stay abroad. The really frightening thing for a central bank, imagine for the sake of argument, as um, Mark Carney proposed at one point, that the Bank of England had a serious crack at creating and exporting Britcoins in order to sort of in order to create an enormous seniorage revenue. Well, you could do that. It might even work. The problem you would face is that at any time you could face an uncontrolled flow of those things back into your domestic economy, which would claim merry hell with exchange rates and everything else, and would be something you would be powerless to prevent. And that's the difference between exporting central bank money and the creation of commercial bank balances abroad. It, 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 it's the same thing until it isn't, but it's, it's the flowback risk, the destabilization risk, which I think worries people so much. Indeed. So I think it's likely that we might see some sort of uh, calibration, even if there is a launch of a CBDC, maybe something starting a little smaller until we are able to find ways to mitigate all these risks. And with that, thank you so much, Simon, for the really excellent masterclass and to our audience for your attention and your participation. Uh, so we'll see you at uh, the next masterclass that will be the final one next week. And for finalists, we'll see you at the next link. Thank you everyone else uh, for your very kind attention. Thanks so much.